Hey there, thanks for joining us today. Before we get started, those of you who've been around for a while know I always like to begin with a fun video, usually something related to cybersecurity. But this year, well, it's 2020 and life has been turned upside down. So in honor of that, here's one of my favorite videos that has absolutely nothing to do with cybersecurity. I hope you enjoy it. So we do need to talk about cybersecurity today. I know it's a topic we hear about a lot and sometimes we want to run away from it, but we really can't. So I'll get to the point. In a short period of time today, I want to share with you the minimum information that you should know in order to effectively protect yourself, providing you your own cybersecurity PPE kit or a go bag, so to speak. Follow these basics and you'll be far ahead of and far safer than 90% of the folks out there. And as you make these things a daily practice, you will become a cybersecurity rock star. The first thing I want to tell you is that perfect cybersecurity does not exist. If it did, everything would be so locked down that we probably wouldn't be able to get any work done. So like driving to work, well, you remember doing that, right? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. We have to take some risks. We know that life is risky and using the internet is risky and bad stuff sometimes happens. We must also realize that we cannot rely on technology alone to protect us. And in spite of what those security vendors say, there really is no magic wand or magic product that can change that. That's because the bad guys are constantly changing their tactics and adjusting all the time to the technical defenses we have, such as firewalls and anti-malware software and anti-spam filters. And yeah, these tools are getting better and better but it's still a constant cat and mouse game and security software and security tools can still be defeated. That's when we become the last line of defense. But here's the deal. These days attackers mostly don't even bother trying to get past this technology. Why? Because they target us directly. The reason for this is that they see us as the weakest link, not because we're incapable or stupid or something, but because we are curious by nature, often busy and in a hurry, and sometimes we have a nothing will happen to me mindset. And bad guys make a ton of money betting on this. This is big business. Attackers are having great success getting people to click on links and open malicious email attachments, download dodgy software, taking advantage of us having the same guessable password across multiple accounts, all of which results in us surrendering our access, our accounts, our computers, our personal information. And of course, this results in data being breached, identities being stolen, and ransomware holding organizations hostage. Yeah, all of this really sucks. But you know what? There is hope, and that hope is you. People ask me all the time, what's the best antivirus out there, Dan? And my answer is always the human brain. When technology fails us, we still have the ability to win. Some people believe humans are the weakest link. 
I happen to disagree with that. I believe we can also be the first line of defense and perhaps the strongest defense that we have. And we can kick the bad guy's butt by knowing and doing just a few things. We've all heard the term social engineering. It's the use of deception, trying to trick you into doing stuff you normally wouldn't do, to scam you, to steal by getting you to unintentionally give up something you have of value and give it up to a total stranger. Phishing is a form of that social engineering that uses a disguised email or a text message as a weapon. The goal is to trick us into believing that the message is something we want or need. A request from your bank, for instance, or a note from someone in our organization. And to click a link, or download an attachment, or surrender our credentials. The attackers masquerade as a trusted entity of some kind, often a real or plausibly real person or a company we might be even doing business with. It's one of the oldest type of cyber attacks out there. Spotting a phishing attempt really isn't that hard to do if you are just aware and alerted to it and know what to look for. So here are some things to look for in a suspicious email. The first thing to watch out for is spoofing. That's when someone is forging the sender's name and their email address in order to make it look legitimate. Hey, I'm from Rackspace.com. Uh, on closer examination, no you aren't. They often place a legitimate name in the middle of a fake email to try to trick your eye into believing that it's a legitimate sender. Be on the lookout and take a close look at the sender's email, especially if you already know what it should be. The next thing to watch out for is bad grammar, because mistakes in the email are the mark of a fake. It's super rare for legitimate emails to have this issue, so always be on the lookout for bad spelling and improper grammar. Another thing to watch out for is links and URLs that take you to bad places. The worst part about these is that what you see is often different from where the link actually takes you. In order to see this, you can hover your mouse over the link without clicking. Or, if you're on a mobile device, you can press and hold the link until the URL appears. Here's the frustration. Even legitimate sites like banks send emails all the time telling you that your bank statement is available or something like that. And it's confusing and crazy sometimes trying to determine what to trust and what not to trust. So here's the strategy I like to use. Don't trust links and emails by default unless you're absolutely sure it's a legitimate destination and you need to use that exact link. Instead, use your own bookmarks and favorites. When I get a notice from my bank, I always use my own bookmark or favorite to go there instead of their link. It's just foolproof that way. If you don't have a bookmark of a particular site yet, Google is your friend. You can search for it. Google won't provide fake links to legitimate sites. Another thing to watch out for is credential stealers. These are fake websites or other places that want your password, and they look exactly like the real thing. Making you think that you have to log in first to access something, but instead what you're really doing is putting in your username and password into a website that's controlled by the bad guys, so then they can use your account for nefarious things. For these, the URL is almost always a dead giveaway. Here's an example of a Microsoft login landing page that looks exactly like the real thing. But if you pay close attention to the URL, you will see that ultimately it is not Microsoft. Always check the address bar to be really sure. Attachments can be super dangerous if they're unexpected and they're from a strange source, especially if you have to do something unusual in order to see their content. That's because they may contain programs in them that if run on your computer will give the bad guy remote access to your computer without you knowing it. If you don't expect it or it's suspicious, don't open it. Malicious attachments can infect your computer with ransomware and you'll lose access to your files and it'll be a really bad day. Always look out for this, especially in Word documents or Excel documents, those sorts of things. An attachment may ask you to enable editing, which may have a legitimate purpose, but then oftentimes afterwards you'll see this enable content button. This is where you want to slowly back away unless you are absolutely sure it's a legitimate document, because if you enable a bad guy's content, it could be a program that gives them access to your computer or infects your computer with something dangerous like ransomware. So some key things to remember are this. Be on the lookout for anything that expects you to act. 
especially if it expects you to act in an unusual way or in a hurry. Never reply to a suspicious email. Why is that? Well, you may actually be interacting with a bad guy. We see this all the time. A bad guy will steal an account and then use it to send out phishing emails. They then create automatic Outlook rules so that any reply that is sent to their phishing emails gets hidden from the real user of the account so they don't see it. So when you reply to an account that is under the control of a bad guy, you almost likely get a reply from the bad guy telling you everything is okay with the message when in reality it's not. Instead, if an email seems suspicious and you know the person who should be sending that email, always contact them in a different manner. Give them a, yeah, I hate this too, but give them a phone call and find out if it's legitimate. An example we see all the time is an email or a text from a boss or a manager with a sense of urgency or panic. These usually request things like money transfers, or they ask you to go out and buy gift cards quickly and send them the codes via email. Unfortunately, because people are often taught to do just exactly what they're told, they fall for these scams. In situations like this where it's unusual, always verify. Always verify. Be empowered to question the legitimacy of these requests and contact your boss or manager in a different manner than the email or the text that they may have sent. Make sure that it's verified that it's real. Of course, you can always forward anything you receive at work to security for review, and we'll get back to you quickly with our analysis of it. And finally, most importantly, slow down. If anyone asks you to do something in a hurry that you would normally do more carefully, stop and make sure it's legitimate. Don't let someone else push you and set that pace. Modern computing power really kicks butt, but it also cracks passwords like these really quickly. If you're using passwords by themselves, you have to have longer ones to beat modern computing power. Pass phrases are the answer, which can be simple short sentences or perhaps only four random words that are hard to crack. Useapassphrase.com is a great place to go to generate these when you need them. We use it all the time. Remember that length of a password is far more important than complexity. And if you have a good passphrase, you shouldn't have to change it all the time. We hear all the time of a social media password database being compromised and all the passwords posted on the internet. Then somebody compromises all the accounts of a user because they use the same passphrase everywhere. That's really scary actually. You want to make sure you use a different passphrase for all your accounts and that's where password managers come in. They are great tools for storing all of your logons and making them available securely on all of your devices including your phone. They can also automatically generate cool passphrases for new accounts you create. In this day and age, you definitely want to get one if you don't already have one. Check out Keeper, LastPass, Dashlane, 1Password. There's some pretty slick ones out there. Of course, none of this really helps if you accidentally put your password somewhere you shouldn't have or surrendered it to a bad guy in a phishing attempt. And that's where having multi-factor authentication set up will keep bad guys from being able to successfully use that passphrase to get into your account. Because you have another layer set up. You have to approve any new logins on any strange devices using an app on your phone. This is really important for financial accounts and anything of high value to you. Go to Google and search for multi-factor authentication setup and check out the Verge article. It will show you how to set up multi-factor authentication on a ton of popular online sites. And also check out twofactorauth.org for all kinds of solid knowledge about multi-factor authentication. And don't forget to set it up for your financial accounts and your retirement accounts especially. Anything that's super important, you'll thank me later. This whole ransomware thing will not only ruin your day, it may challenge 2020 for superiority on the This Sucks scale. Ransomware is software that encrypts all your files and holds them hostage until you pay the attacker for a key to get them back. It's the number one attack these days because it makes the bad guys a ton of money. 
losing access to all your files is a nightmare even if you do have them backed up because you'll probably have to rebuild your PC losing all of your department's files would really be a hashtag fail with an embarrassment that would follow you for a long time ransomware is just one reason why it's so important to only download reputable software from reputable sources if you need to download something at work make sure you get permission from your department's information security officer we'll talk more about them later and then send the link to security. We'll review the software and let you know if it's safe or if it's trash worthy. If you're going to download something on your home PC, remember to virus total all the things. Download the software, then upload it to virus total to see what a bunch of malware engines think about the software. If it's not completely green, think twice before installing it. Actually, we recommend that you look elsewhere. Do you use public Wi-Fi? Come on, be honest. If you do, you are trusting what happens to your information and where it goes to whoever is in control of the Wi-Fi access point. And if that access point isn't up to date, that owner may be someone it shouldn't be, wanting to spy on you or intercept your information. That's why we always recommend the use of a VPN when on any public network. County VPN works fine for this if you're working, but otherwise check out getting a personal VPN for your PC if you travel a lot or rely on hotels or airports. Two of our favorites include F-Secure Freedom and NordVPN because they protect your privacy as well. Oh, and that Departmental Information Security Officer I mentioned earlier. We call them ISOs or ISOs. Every department has one, and they're responsible for being the security eyes and ears within your department and making sure your department complies with its regulations and keeps its business processes and business data secure, among all kinds of other stuff. You should know who your department's ISO is, so you can contact them directly if you need approval to install something, want to report a security incident, or just want to know if I really do have a cat. You can find the list of department ISOs in SharePoint. Just click on ITD, then go to the Resources menu. You can view the list there. Finally, and most importantly, we are always here to help. You can email security with any question you have or to report something if you can't locate your ISO. And remember, if you goof up and fall for something, we won't make fun of you or scold you or make you do 50 push-ups or even buy us coffee, although that would be really sweet, we really understand that mistakes happen, and we'd rather you report it to us so we can make sure that nothing super bad happened rather than hide under your desk and be afraid. We're here to support you. We're here to help. Thanks for watching today.